Nigel Marvin, a time-traveling zoologist and a man who has had his fair share of close scrapes with dinosaurs. But the Earth has witnessed more terrible monsters than these. What Nigel is about to learn about prehistory is that no matter how bad things get on land, the one thing you should never, ever do is get in the water. In this latest adventure, Nigel will be traveling back and forth through prehistory to visit seven different time zones and dive in the seven deadliest seas ever. Each sea he visits will be more dangerous than the last, with bigger, nastier predators. Creatures it's hard to believe once lived on this planet and of course, he's saving the worst till last. Nigel's first stop in this perilous navigation through time is a period called the Ordovician. To get back there from the 21st century, you have to go unbelievably far back in time. Back before the Ice Age, before the first humans, before even the dinosaurs. The Ordovician is a mind-boggling 450 million years ago, so far back that plants have yet to evolve. It's a world ruled by creepy crawlies and fantastically unsuited to humankind. The atmosphere at this time, it's atrocious. Much less oxygen and much more carbon dioxide than I'm used to. Without this special air mix, I'd really feel sick and get bad headaches. Just look around and you can see why the atmosphere is so different. There's no life at all on the land. There's no insects in the air. There's not even worms in the ground. And most crucially of all, there's no plants. There's not a speck of green. So the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's not being absorbed by them, and they're not boosting the atmosphere with oxygen. But it's a different story out there in the sea. There's been life there for hundreds of millions of years. And you can take it from me, evolution has produced some real monsters. Now it was time to find one. First, some bait. In the Ordovician, that's the easy bit. With no land animals to scavenge along the beach, anything the sea spits up just lies here rotting. An armor-plated fish. Now, into shallow water to flush out one unpleasant little critter that I was going to be seeing a lot of. A sea scorpion, one of the most grotesque of predators. And look, look at that, look at the tail curling. That's how they get their name, but there's no venom in there, like their namesakes on the land. And you've got to be careful, are those formidable pincers at the front? Oh. The 
scorpion gave me a graphic demonstration of just how formidable its claws are. It literally shredded the bait at my feet before moving on to bigger prey. Ah! You are Nigel. Slash my leg. It's another scar for the collection. <laughs> As I found out, those sea scorpions are pretty fearsome. But there's much bigger sea monsters out there. The sea scorpions, they're not the top predators. But to see the real big ones, I need a little more than a fish on a stick. I'm going to try with this. It looks a bit like a giant woodlouse, but of course, it's a trilobite. There's no relatives of this alive in the 21st century. There's up to 15,000 species. They range in size from a really tiny one, a millimetre in length, to this big one. This is about as big as they get. And I need one like this because I'm going to use this like a fisherman with a fly. And I'm going to try to attract a much bigger catch. And all I need to do is to insert this camera into the carcass. And if you're squeamish, Look away now, because what I've got to do is pop out the eye of this trilobite. There we go. Oh. There's so many surprises here. The sun's setting, the evening's come, and it's been so quick the day's flown by. That's because I forgot, in Ordovician times, the Earth's spinning much faster, and that means that it's a 21-hour day, not 24 hours. So a watch like this, it's useless here. And look at that. It's going to be dark very soon, and we can't do anything more today. Anything you do, you try to do it, you know, you try to... Today, I'm hoping to dive with a sea monster. There's a special air mix in here. If I breathe this Ornovician air at pressure under the water, I'd become unconscious. So this is crucial for me. I also need this. This is a bit before its time. It's a bite-proof shark suit. And of course, sharks haven't evolved yet. But I'm hoping this will give me protection from those vicious sea scorpions. I knew the bigger predators would be out in deeper water, so I ventured out into the middle of the bay. This will look very appetising, but for the predators around here, this should be a tasty snack. And I'm hoping that camera is going to catch the moment when a monstrous predator tries to snaffle this up. like trilobites. Come on, let go. <sighs> it was late afternoon before I got a decent bite. Something, something interesting there, and it is much bigger than a sea scorpion. <laughs> I've taken the camera. That's the end of the trilobite cam. I have got 
to see what that is. I don't know what's happened here, but if I follow the line, I should be able to find the predator. The camera's not at the end, which probably means that the predator isn't far away. This is intriguing. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're all gathering, but first there was one sea scorpion, then there was another, then another, then another. And now they are all around me. There's a whole carpet of them moving along the sea floor. They're whizzing past my head. They're all heading in one direction. And there it is. It's an author cone. the biggest predator that the world has seen up until this time. He, he sensed me here. Getting my heart hammering. I don't want to be grabbed by those tentacles, but those simple eyes, they should shun the light. So all I can do is start flashing my light and maybe that will discourage him. Now he's gone, I can't see where he is. There's still the sea scorpions there. There! There's the orca coat. And it spotted one of the sea scorpions. They're dragged back to the mouth. There's a horny beak. Oh, you can hear it. I can actually hear it under the water. Hear the crunching sounds as the sea scorpions are crushed by the beak. These orca cones probably spend a lot of time in deep water. Light doesn't penetrate too well down there, so the eyes don't work very well and they rely on another sense. They will actually smell out their prey and then crush them to bits. The orca cone, that really is the top predator of Ordovician times. It's not swimming very fast. If I can catch up. There. Ah, uh, yes. Right onto the tip of the shell. It's a wonderful texture. And I am hitching a ride on the back of an author cone. As it got gloomier, I realised the author cone was dragging me deeper. Time to get off. Thanks, author cone. Thanks for the ride. God. This is what they were doing. I saw them moving in the shallows, moving towards the shore, and this is a mass spawning. It's a full moon at the moment. This is the highest tide, and they're laying their eggs in the sand. The eggs will be protected. And when the next high tide comes in about a month or so, the young larvae will hatch and be taken back out to sea. And some of these sea scorpions, they're gonna stay around here until the eggs hatch. Fossils have been found with baby sea scorpions inside the stomachs of the big ones, and that's what they do. They wait around here and feed on the babies as they hatch on the next high tide. Mm. 
The Ordovician, then, isn't exactly a picnic. Anywhere the air gives you a headache and you can't go swimming without a chainmail suit probably isn't going to take off as a holiday destination. But prehistory has worse still to offer. The next deadly sea is the Triassic. To get there, Nigel has to travel halfway back to the 21st century to 230 million years BC. It's a time when reptiles are taking over the oceans and the first dinosaurs are only just appearing. The Triassic is a crucial time for marine life. Something new's happened. The fish or the mammals, they're not the most ferocious animals out there. This sea is dominated by a group that used to just live on the land, the reptiles. Reptiles dominate everywhere right now. Winged reptiles, the pterosaurs, rule the skies. And the future lords of the land, the dinosaurs, have just evolved. But they're not much to look at yet. Of course, I was here to explore life in the sea, home to the largest Triassic reptiles of them all. Fortunately, sea reptiles are easy enough to spot because they have to come up for air. My first sighting was a nothosaur. The nothosaurs, they could be a bit nippy, but there's bigger reptiles down there that could easily kill a person. So this is my insurance policy, an electric prod. If they come too close, this should deter them. There's not just one note the saw, there's a pair of them. And they're inquisitive, coming closer and closer, they're so curious. But I'm the first human that they've seen. You don't know how they're going to react. And I'm glad I've got this electric prod in case they become just too inquisitive. But at the moment, they're just curious, circling around me. They've got a mouthful of teeth like razors, they're interlocking. That would seem to me to be the perfect fish trap. And they certainly move fast enough to catch the fish that are around here. <laughs> wow. There's one coming close now and I'm going to try something. Like with alligators, there's only one safe way to hold an othosaur. And that's round the jaws. Way. <laughs> wow. A prehistoric ride with a nothosaur. They can close those jaws with tremendous force, but the muscles that open them, they are really weak. But nothosaurs, like all sea reptiles, they've got to go up to the surface to breathe. I can't hold him for too long. I'm going to let him go now. Go on, boy. Off you go. Hiding here, this isn't dangerous, but it's surely one of the most preposterous reptiles ever. Tanistrophius. Great long neck, great long tail, there's hardly any body at all. That long neck is perfect for an ambush predator. And what it probably does is sweep that neck through the water, sweep it through a shoal of fish. Ah. Ah. 
chopped its tail. This has happened to me many times when I was a little kid catching lizards. They do this as well. And this is an insurance policy. If they're attacked by a predator, the predator's distracted by the tail and the creature can escape. And like lizards, he'll grow the tail again. And it shouldn't do him much harm. Look, he's swimming away perfectly there. Golly, this tail is spasming so much. I can hardly hold on to it. Where did that come from? I think it's a Simbospondylus, one of that great group of marine reptiles, the ichthyosaurs. He's a primitive member of the group, but they're going to evolve into a whole variety of forms. They'll be around for about another hundred million years. But he's coming a bit too close. and that slow movement, that's deceiving. With one lash of that tail, they can have really great bursts of speed. God, my heart's hammering, that lunge at me, that was a warning shot. That's really up the ante on this dive. I need the electric prod now, and he's coming again. He's coming in again, and I'm going to use it. What a spectacular reptile. Two seas down, five to go. The next encounter takes Nigel back deeper into the past to meet the armored fish of the Devonian. Predators that are quite literally as hard as nails. I'm using the time map to get my head round where I've been. These spans of time are so immense. My first adventure, I went all the way back in time 450 million years ago to ride an orthocone and tussle with those sea scorpions. My second dive, that was 230 million years before the present day. That was with those bizarre sea reptiles. We're now here 360 million years ago. Welcome to the age of giant armoured fish. How was the dive, mate? Oh, outstanding. Have That's you got one? Did you see one? I saw, saw it. It came so close. I'll get this in the machine. Okay. The cameraman Mike, he did a reconnaissance dive just to see what was around. And from what he's saying, we've actually struck gold on the first dive. Exactly what we came here for. Oh. Look at that. Look at that. That's it. Can't be anything else. A Dunkley Osteus. Well done, Mike. I mean, what was it like? That's like a real leviathan there. My heart was in my mouth. It just, just took my breath away. And that thing is over 30 feet long. Must weigh four or five tons. That's as much as two or three elephants. Let's pause it, have a look at this. Oh, what a fearsome head. And this shows the classic features of Dunkley Osteus. Armour plating on the front of the body. That can be up to two inches thick. And look at that mouth. Those aren't teeth, those are extensions of the jaw bones. They're for shearing through the prey. And this thing has to punch through other armoured fish. And those jaws are backed up by powerful muscles at the back of the neck there. Look at that. And this is exciting. If this stays around, it's going to be my turn next. And we're going to find out how powerful those jaws actually are. Our plan was to hand feed a Dunkley Osteus and my job was to get the bait. Meanwhile, the crew was building a cage for my protection. But why was it round? Well, in the same way that a dog can't bite a beach ball, we hoped that the jaws of the Dunkley Osteus would slide off these bars. Good. 
a big tug. Fortunately for me, there's plenty of life in the sea in the Devonian. Unlike on land, where as yet there are no creatures bigger than a centipede. This is a placoderm. It's a Greek word, it means armor plating, and you can see why. This is in the same family as Dunkleosteus. And for a naturalist, this is a privilege indeed. These fish were only around for 50 million years, then they became extinct. There's nothing like this around in the 21st century. I've got a bet on with the crew that the Dunkleosteus will slice through the bait if it's actually wrapped in chainmail. This is where you feel like you're most vulnerable, actually swimming into the cage with a great chunk of bait. I'm in now, and it will probably take a few minutes for the trail of smell to bring in the predators. And fingers crossed, we'll be able to see Dunkley Osteus. Look what's arrived. This must be the most preposterous shark ever. Look at that fin on the back. Scientists call it the ironing board shark, and you can see why. Must be a male, only the males had that bizarre dorsal fin. Probably to help with mating, probably to display to females. Maybe used in courtship battles between males. And these are some of the first sharks ever to evolve. And this is great for me, I am such a shark fan. But that is, it's surreal. Now he's been spooked by something. It's a deadly osteus. It must have smelled the bed. This is what we came for. And it's coming straight towards us. See that really thick protective armor on the head there? Over two inches thick. Only the first third of the body's covered with that. Look at that. These fish, they've got these massive jaws with big, sharp shears sticking out. And what they do is they slice them together, just like scissors working. The very action of slicing them together keeps them sharp. And with that, they can cut through anything. Let's see if I can win my bet. survive a Dunkley Osteus. Log on to bbc.co.uk slash science and take part in your own adventure through the seven deadly seas.